You there? Good day, mate. This is Mrs. Klein. And Mr. Creighton. We're here today with your podcast for Chapter 7, Lesson 3, that's entitled The Mongol Empire. All right, in Lesson 1, we learned about people from the north who invaded China after the fall of the Han Dynasty. And nearly a thousand years later, as you're going to find out in this lesson, people from the north once again came in and invaded China. Okay, as always, you guys, we've got some vocabulary terms, and in this case, three of the pe- that three of the vocabulary terms are names. So you're really going to want to keep them clear. Figure out some kind of a strategy that you can do that's going to help you remember who did what. Um, four terms this time: Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, Mongol ascendancy, and Marco Polo. And don't forget, if you hear this sound, that means you've just heard a vocabulary term. And we're gonna go over the big idea and essential questions. The big idea, rulers have a great impact on their society and leave lasting impressions. Okay, first essential question. How do belief systems influence a people's way of life? How do rulers shape present and future civilizations? And last but not least, how are lasting effects of rulers reflected in a society? All right, our first section is titled The Mongol Invasion. You can find this on pages 233 to 234. And the question you should be able to answer, or you should be thinking about, is who are the Mongols? The Mongols were a people that lived to the who lived to the northwest of China. They were nomads. Nomads are people who move from place to place. The Mongols had no central government. Instead, they lived in independent family groups called clans. Around 1206, though, a man named Temujin united the clans for the first time. He became the Khan, or ruler, of all Mongol tribes. He took the name Genghis Khan, which means universal ruler. As nomads, the Mongols had a military advantage over settled people. Settled people had to defend their towns and villages, and nomads could quickly could attack quickly and then move on. Using this advantage, Genghis attacked northern China and Central Asia. Genghis died in 1227. After he died, his son Ogadai took power. Ogadai conquered all of northern China. He also extended the Mongol Empire as far as, as, far as Russia and Persia. The Mongols divided the empire into four parts. Each part was called a Kanite. A different relative of Genghis Khan ruled each Kanite. Kublai Khan took power over the empire in 1260. Kublai was Genghis's grandson. In 1260, the Chinese Song Dynasty still controlled southern China. Kublai defeated the Song in 1279. The Mongols now controlled all of China, and they ruled until 1368. Okay, you should be able to answer this question now. By what year did the Mongols conquer all of China? Our next section is the Mongol government. You can find this on page 237. The question you should be thinking about, what was the Mongol government like? Kublai Khan was the first ruler in 300 years to control all of China. The Mongols were also the first foreign power to rule China. Kublai ruled for 15 years. He died in 1294. The Mongols did not have much experience with government, but the Chinese had a lot of experience. Kublai kept some of the Chinese governing traditions. For example, he built his capital at Beijing using Chinese styles. He also declared himself emperor, beginning the Yuan Dynasty. The Chinese were familiar with such steps. Taking these steps made it easier for Kublai to control all of China. However, Kublai did not let Chinese people gain political power. He kept political power for the Mongols. He, he ended the testing system for choosing government officials. Only Mongols and trusted foreigners could get important positions. Mongols limited Chinese people to minor jobs with little power. Kublai Khan was a capable leader. He worked to rebuild China, which had suffered from years of warfare. He also promoted trade and helped to build contacts with other regions. So see if you can answer this question, you guys. What role did Chinese people play in the Mongol government? Our last section is opening China to the world. You can find this on pages 237 to 239. The question you should be able to, you should be thinking about, what was the Mongol ascent? Ascendancy. Kublai Khan helped make China more open to the outside world. The Mongols encouraged foreign trade. They also welcomed visitors from other countries. In the past, China had closed overland trade routes because of war and banditry, or stealing. Now, the Mongols controlled Central Asia. Mongol control made the overland routes safe. Don't you guys remember when we were talking about West Africa, as long as the trades are, the trade routes were safe, then everybody benefited from that. Yeah. Okay, all right, so now the Mongols come along and they, um, they make the uh, overland trade route safe again. The period of control is called the Mongol ascendancy. Groups of traders traveled over the Silk Roads. These were ancient trade routes between China and the Black Sea. 
Traders carried silks, ceramics, tea, and other goods to Western markets. Traders returned with new foods, plants, and minerals. The Mongols also encouraged trade by the sea. Ships sailed across the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. Merchants traded goods in busy Chinese ports, such as Wangzhou and Fuzhou. Increased trade led to more Chinese contact with people from other countries. People from Arabia, Persia, and India visited China. Europeans also visited China. These visitors helped to tell other parts of the world about Chinese civilization. And I, I would like to, I, I'm willing, and I bet Mr. Creighton's willing to give a bonus point for the first person who can let me know when we were studying um, Islam, uh, there was some something that they learned from the Chinese that really helped in the development of cities and things, especially in Cordoba. Yeah. Okay. All right. The most famous European visitor was Marco Polo. He was a trader from Venice, Italy. He traveled the Silk Roads with his father and uncle. He arrived in China around 1275 and stayed for 17 years. After he arrived, Polo entered the service of Kublai Khan. He traveled around China doing work for the government. Later, he published a book about his travels. The book was a great success in Europe. Even so, many Europeans found some of Polo's stories about China hard to believe. The question you guys should be able to answer in your head right now, how did China become more open to foreigners? Okay, all right. Uh, remind you guys, you're going to have a podcast quiz coming up. Hopefully, you've been easily, it's been easy for you to fill out the podcast notes as you've been listening, but you're going to have a vocabulary development podcast quiz tomorrow. Again, there's those four terms Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, Mongol Ascendancy, and Marco Polo. All right, you guys, all the best to you. Buzz off.